I am so happy that you all decided to join us for our very last Conversations on the Couch. Last? Very last <laughs> of the semester. But you know what? We're going out with a bang. Y'all know I have talked about this person how many times? A few. <laughs> what do you hold in your hand every Wednesday? Uh, uh, when we do leadership? Tell, tell me, what do we hold in our hand? Life skills book. The life skills book. He wrote that. He wrote that book. Oh, OMG. OMG. Take a say, OMG. So before you go, you might want to get your book signed. So yes, uh, Mr. O'Neill Chapman. Ma'am, Mr. O'Neill Chapman is here all the way from Mississippi to share with y'all today. We have been working on life skills book. We on the life skills book. We've been talking about being successful in college, knowing ourselves, becoming self-aware, becoming socially aware, managing our time. We've been doing that every Wednesday, and what a joy it is to have one of my dear friends all the way from seminary uh, here to share with you all. And his presentation is going to be about the power of your story and developing student resilience in a post-pandemic world. So please, help me out. Give a warm TSU Wesley welcome to Mr. O'Neill Chapman. Thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all, thank y'all. Um, look, I hope y'all have been enjoying the book, uh, gaining some things from it, gaining some, some insight uh, from what I put in the book. But I, listen, today I want to talk to y'all about something very important, very critical. Uh, I was in the same position y'all are in right now, uh, in undergrad, just trying to figure this thing out. Uh, but now we're living in a whole new reality, like this post-pandemic reality. And so many times you have to learn how to pivot, how to make shifts, uh, how to change things. I had to, I had to change my whole business after the pandemic, right? Because uh, when it hit, all my contracts that I had to speak, all my engagements, overnight, gone, right? And I had to build this thing all back up to get back out on the road, traveling again, speaking. And so uh, the power of your story, I want y'all to start using your story. And basically when I say the power of your story, what I'm saying is that no matter where you come from, who you are, what your background is, your story adds to your success. Your story leads to your success. And I don't want you to be ashamed. I don't want you to be bitter about it. I don't want you to, to walk around with your head down about your story. Uh, a little bit about me, I was born to 14 year old parents in rural Mississippi, 1982, dirt poor, no joints, no new jeans, no new shirt, nothing. My grandma already had three girls that she was raising. Then here I come by my mom, she's only 14. Now my grandma got another mouth to feed. That's my story. Now, when I, use the, when I think about using the power of that story, what I'm saying is that uh, it is adversity that leads you to your success, right? I, I, I'm not ashamed of that story, right? I don't, I don't walk with my head down because of that story because that story helped me. That story gave me resilience. It gave me uh, the inner, like that inner fight that I needed, right, to, to move this thing forward. So what we're going to talk about is the power of your story, developing student resilience in a post-pandemic world. Next slide. And so... Uh, so I'm working on my doctoral degree. I'm about 18 months from graduating. And when we first got to class, uh, Professor Harvey gave us what he called a Lectio Divina. And what a Lectio Divina is, is when you sit quietly with a passage, you take it all in, you don't rush through it, but you just take it all in to really get all of the important nuggets out of that passage. And so I want to read this to you, and I want to just kind of get some of your thoughts. It's called Cause I Ain't Got a Pencil by Joshua T. Dickerson. I woke myself up because we ain't got an alarm clock. Dug in a dirty clothes basket cause ain't nobody washed my uniform. Brushed my hair and teeth in the dark cause the lights ain't on. Even got my baby sister ready cause mama wasn't home. Got us both to school on time to eat us a good breakfast. Then when I got to class, the teacher fussed at me because I ain't got a pencil. Sit with that. Reflect on that. Give me a few words that stuck out to you. Ain't. ain't. 
Somebody always hit me with the ain't. Any other words that stick out? As you was hearing it, what, what, what stuck out to you? What words came to mind? My. My. Right. Any other words? Any other words that, that aren't up here? What are you thinking? Responsible kid. Come on. Responsible. Responsible. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Definitely survival mode. Survival mode. Nice. Nice. All right. Next slide. Just want you to reflect. And so as you do this reflection, I want you to think about your own story. That was his story. Now I want you to begin to think about your own story. Your story holds power. No matter how bitter, shameful, and embarrassed you are, your story matters because it connects you to success. Now, I had a, a, now I was never ashamed to tell the story about how I was born and how I was raised. But there was a story I used to be ashamed to tell. And so when I graduated high school in the year 2000, I went to the University of Mississippi. And I got there and I stayed there for about a year and a half. And let's just say, I didn't do what I was supposed to do, right? And by the time I ended, by the time I left University of Mississippi, I had a 1.7 GPA. 1.7 GPA. I'm, I'm back at home. I'm 19 years old. All my peers are in college. I'm back at home, and guess where I'm working? In a factory. See, the person, you, the person standing before you this morning is not the same person, right? I'm working in a fact in a hot factory. And it never failed. Every day somebody would tell me that they'll be older, they'll be like 40 years old. I'm working beside people 50 years old. They've been in here 30 years. They like, bro, you don't, you don't belong in here. You don't, you're not supposed to be in here. You're supposed to be doing something else. It never failed. No matter where I went, somebody would say, you just don't belong in here. You're supposed to be doing something else. And it finally clicked. And so I finally got that thing together. I started reading four to five hours a night, every single day. I started reading four books a month, every single month. And that is how I ended up getting back in school, getting on the dean's list, going to seminary, dean's list the whole time at the Morehouse School of Religion, now 18 months from my doctoral degree. But it was, I had to learn resilience with that 1.7 GPA. Why? Because that brought me shame, because it's like, it's like my grandma had worked so hard, spent all this time raising me, giving me these skills for me to go to college and not do what I was supposed to do. But the thing was, I had another chance. And when you get another chance, turn that thing around, then you can begin to see the success that you're trying to see. And so um, that's, why, that's why I'm telling you that your story holds power. And the great thing about it is you control your own narrative. So what that means is you don't let anybody take your story and use it against you. You control your own narrative as a college student. Whatever you've been through, whatever your situation is, your circumstance is, you control that particular narrative. Next slide. So uh, Peter Block, so this is one of the books we're using in my program. And uh, this guy by the name of Peter Block writes this book called Community. And in community, what he says is that communities are nothing more than conversations. I had never heard community framed that way before. But he says that communities are actual conversations, that in order to have a real community, people have to be in conversation with each other. If not, you just have a place where there's houses. But there's no real community because the people are not in constant conversation within the so-called community. But he flips it and says that communities are built from the assets and gifts of the citizens, not from the needs and deficiencies. So what does that have to do with your story? People will use your story as a deficiency if you let them. People will say, you can't go to college. Your mama didn't go. Any first generation college students in here? You're the first one. Oh, my God. I'm writing a book for first gen students right now. That is awesome. I love to see first gen students because somebody down the line has told you nobody did it in your family. And that's when you say, so what? That's when you say, who cares? Nobody in my family has done it. I'm going to do it. Right. So so he says, don't let your 
um, deficiencies and needs become the main story. Allow your assets and your gift. Your story is an asset. When I met Pastor Tab, we was in seminary. She had three small children. Do you know how many times I've used her story on the road? She don't even, she don't even be knowing this. She don't even be knowing this. Like, it was such an inspiration to sit beside somebody in class that had three small children there on the under roll. What that did for me was it gave me, it, it gave me this mindset that I have no excuse. If she can do it with three small children, what am I to do there a single person? Right? That's what I'm talking about, using your gifts as a asset. When you look around and you connect with your fellow classmate, allow your story to connect with their story. They may have something in their story that empowers you, that inspires, that inspired me. And when I'm talking to other young ladies, I'm like, stop telling me you can't go to college. I went to school with somebody that had three small children that was on the honor roll every semester. Right? So that, that means you can do it. If you use your story, the assets, and not allow it to become a deficiency. Right? Next slide. And so, raise your hand if you heard of emotional intelligence, EQ. Nice, nice. We've all heard of IQ, right? But EQ, um, I teach EQ because I think it's so important because you need emotional intelligence, self-awareness, social awareness, self-management, positive decision-making. These are all EQ skills. So resilience is the capacity to recover from unpleasant and damaging events. 90% of your college success will be your ability to be resilient and make pivots. So that's all I'm here to say today is that 90% of your success today will be based upon how you're able to make pivots. So if you got an elf, how are you going to now pivot to get that A? Yeah. If you're about to flunk out, how are you going to now make a pivot to get your grade point average to what you need to stay? 90% of your success is about how you make pivots, how you shift. College is all about shifts. You came in with one major on your mind, guess what? By the time you graduate, you are something else. Yeah. You made a shift, right? We came in, I want to be pre-med, till you got the biology, you're like, uh-uh. <laughs> this ain't me, right? You want to be an engineer, till you like, get in there, you have to take all the math class, you're like, nah, dog. This college algebra is killing me, right? But you have to make these colleges about shifts. It's teaching you how to make pivots, how to shift, and so, that's about 90% actually of your journey. Next slide. I want to show you just a few profiles in resilience. If you look on the screen, you see people who had to be resilient. Oprah Winfrey fired from her first job. Now a billionaire. They said she didn't have what it, what it took to be on TV. Wow. Profile in resilience. Walt Disney. Guess what they said about Walt Disney? They said he didn't have imagination. <laughs> right? The king of, now, the king of, if you ever see anything about Disney, it is the epitome of imagination. They said he had no imagination, right? But he had to show some type of resistance. Viola Davis, great actress. She tells her story growing up dirt poor, extremely poor, right? And how that hindered her in life, but look at what she is now. Tyler Perry lived in a van. Yeah. He's now a billionaire. And so what we're talking about is, this is what resilience looks like. Resilience is you being able to get through your circumstance using the power of your story. Remember, your story is not a deficiency. It is an actual asset. Next slide. And so this is going to be the last one, and then we can do some, some, some questions. So I wanted to show this because Silicon Valley understands something about EQ. Uh, a few years ago, they decided that they're going to drop the degree requirement to work in Silicon Valley. And the reason they did this, a lot of companies understood that it does not matter if you have a lot of high IQ people, <laughs> but you have people with low EQ. In other words, 
Big Mama never say like this, boy, you, you got a lot of book sense, but no common sense. Yeah. Right? And emotional intelligence about you having the common sense. They were always teaching us EQ skills and we didn't know it. So when your, when your big mama would say something like, if your friends jump off a bridge, are you going to jump too? That's an actual EQ skill called self-awareness. They're wanting you to learn how to be more self-aware. So if they say, uh, I'm going to feed you with a long handle spoon, they're basically teaching you the skill of self-management and self-regulation, that you learn who your true friends are. And you may have to feed them with a long handle spoon, which means I don't let you get too close to me. Right? All those things are EQ skills. We didn't give it that name, but that's what they was teaching us the whole time. And so uh, Silicon Valley says we need more people with high EQ. So I need y'all to start perfecting your social skills, not social media skills. Yeah. There's a difference. Social skills. I go to high schools all over the nation. I bring students to the front of the class. I say, start a conversation. I step back. They stand there for two minutes. Nobody says a word. I'm thinking to myself, now you can text a whole paragraph. You can get on Instagram. You can get on Facebook, but can't start a basic conversation. They don't know to extend their hand. Hey, how you doing? I'm on their chat, man. Something that simple. We're losing, there is a breakdown in the social skills of our students. That's why I wrote the book, Life Skills for College Students. I need you to start back focusing on being more social. So what does that look like? If you, you walk into a room and you see somebody in the room that nobody is talking to, go over and get to know them. Go see who that is. Talk to them. How you doing? My name is so-and-so. -so -so. What's your major? This is this. Start starting basic conversations because you never know who you're sitting next to. You never know who's in the classroom with you. I was down in a high school in Panama City, Florida, and a boy walks in who had just made a 36 on his ACT, the highest score you can make. I'm in a room full of athletes. I say, raise your hand if you know him. One person raised their hand. I said, man, this is a shame. This man just made a 36, a perfect score. Nobody knows him. But if he had 36 touchdowns this year, everybody in the building would know who he is. If he had just scored 36 points last night, everybody in the building would know who he is. But he scores a 36 on his ACT, nobody knows who he is. So start getting to know people. Start having those basic conversations. Get to know the person that's sitting next to you. That's how you begin to perfect these things we call life skills. Last thing, Truett Cathy, who founded Chick-fil-A, has a quote, and I, I always wonder what separated Chick-fil-A from McDonald's, from Burger King, from all these different places, right? I'm like, they just operate different. They're high in EQ. Somebody has taught these people something. And Truett Cathy says, his philosophy was always this. If we become better, we'll ultimately become bigger. And they're always trying to get better. And so now the line is so long, now they're coming out to your car with the iPad. They're always getting better. When you pull up the McDonald's, what's up, dog? What you want? Right? There's a difference in the customer service level. Somebody is just uh, fascinated with getting cars through the line as fast as possible, getting you that little cheeseburger. But somebody says, if we operate with high EQ skills, we got you for life. Because even if somebody talked bad about Chick-fil-A, you'd be like, no, nah, I don't believe it, dog. Right. <laughs> I don't even believe you. You'd be like, man, I had bad experience with Chick-fil-A. I don't believe it. Ain't no way. And so somebody understood we have to be high in the area of EQ. Because if we become better, we ultimately become bigger. Better and bigger. And so I want you to focus on those things. I want you to use the power of your story. Very quick question. I want you to reflect on a challenging experience you have faced during your college journey. How did you overcome it? Remember now, we're talking about resilience. Resilience is you being able to 
get over the hurdles, you being able to make pivots, you being able, if you don't remember any word I said today, remember pivot. That's your word for the day, pivot. How do you pivot? In basketball, they call this a what? Pivot foot, right? You can spin all the way around on this one foot right here, as long as you don't pick it up. But you can constantly do spin. You can go this way, you can go this way, you can go this way, you can go this way. But I didn't pick up that pivot, but I'm able to make shifts all the way around. And so your word for the day is pivot. How are you going to pivot? Right? So I want you now to reflect upon one challenge you faced during your college journey. How did you overcome it? Anybody want to share? This is a safe space. Go ahead, bro. Uh, so I had lost my mother. My oh, man. Uh, my college uh, year. And uh, be honest, my motivation was my grandmother. I just lost my grandmother a couple of weeks ago. And she was the reason, like, cause I feel like my grand, my mother was living through my grandmother, and she wanted me to see me graduate and everything. So I kept a promise that I would graduate for her. And uh, mm. how close are you to graduation? Were you? I was a month away from graduation. Ah. I was a month away, and uh, still, uh, it's still kind of hard to talk about because yeah. I'm, I'm the only child. And I was the only grandson too, so it's just like mm. uh, trying not to cry right now. It's okay. Safe space, cool. Uh, how far are you from graduation now? Like, how, I, I graduated. Oh, you graduated? I'm, I'm starting grad school next semester. <laughs> dope, 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 dope. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's just like it's been an emotional roller coaster for me. Hmm. Going through a lot of trials and tribulations in my life, you know. Uh, I'm just saying I'm grateful right now. I'm just got to keep on pushing. Man, talk about a pivot. Talk about a pivot, man. Man, anybody else raised by grandma in here? Man, it's just something. <laughs> it's a different experience. <laughs> she got a different kind of care and concern. Like, I, I don't know, I can't even put it in words, but it's like, it's just different. Like, man, I, I'm glad you kept going. I'm glad you made that pivot and kept going. Anybody else want to share? Don't be shy. Anybody else had a, had a, it don't have to be a Delph experience, like, just any experience you've had that caused you to have to make a shift. I'll, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, oh. No, you good. You good. She good. She good. You good. Oh. Um, it was last semester. I had like uh, over five thousand dollar balance. Mm. I was like, um, you know, this little work study job. I'm, I'm not gonna cover this. So I didn't tell my parents because I wasn't gonna stress them out. I just, um, I was like, okay, what am I gonna do? So I just prayed about it and kept on going about my day, and then. I got like an email and it was like, oh, come to our office, you won like $5,000 scholarship. What? <laughs> wow. So that was me, the shift, like the shift happened in my prayer life. And I was like, I, there's no other choice. I don't have another choice but to trust God because I don't have $5,000. So that really is what happened to me. Oh, man. Come on, give her a hand. Man. 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 You see, see what I'm saying? Listen, that's why I call this the power of your story. Like when you leave here, you're going to be able to tell somebody going to be like, man, I can't go to college because I ain't got five grand. You're going to tell them that story. Right. That story is going to empower. When he tell his story, it's going to empower another young man to keep going. This is why I say don't allow people to use your story as a deficit. Don't allow them to shift your story to, to shame you, to embarrass you. Know your story. I was shamed. I was at home, 19 with a 1.7 GPA. All my peers are in college. I'm working beside people 50 years old in a factory. That's shame, right? But I had to pivot. Like, how do I pivot? Like, like you know, 
I got a certain type of brilliance, but it's not that I don't have to study brilliance. Mine come from like actually putting in the time. As Malcolm Gladwell will say, whatever craft you have, you have to put in 10,000 hours into your craft. So I put in 10,000 hours into the craft to become brilliant. I can't just go in like y'all just take those tests like I ain't looked at the book and still get an A, right? But I believe I can always outwork that person because they cocky, they arrogant, and I'm, that's when I'm gonna creep up on you with my work, with the, that, that grind my grandma put in me. That, that's where I'm gonna get you at, right? Because you're gonna, be, you're gonna be chilling, you're gonna be over at the student union, I'm reading those four books a month, I'm gonna catch you, right? And that's how I get, so when you, you have to use whatever skills you have. All of us have skills, we have gifts, we have talents. Anybody remember the parable of the talent? Now, the, the key thing for me in the parable of talent is the tragedy is not that God gives people more talents than you. The tragedy is you won't use the one he gave you. If he just gave you one and he gave them five, that's cool. The one you got <laughs> can change the world, but you won't use the one you got. And so that's why you have to go above and beyond. If you're not just that person that can just go in and ace test without looking at the book, well, you're going to have to put in the extra time. You got to read. Rewrite those notes two or three times until you get it. But whatever you got to do, don't come up here and end up back at the house with no degree. See, see you don't want You never want to say, I just went to college. No, I graduated college. Not I just went. A lot of people went. <laughs> Take back at the crib. Don't just say you went, say you graduated. Yeah. Come up here and leave with something. And so that, that's what I'm saying is that the power of your story, anybody else before we move to the, what y'all call the, what they call it on the couch? The conversation. The conversation yeah. on the couch. I, I, have, I have something Go ahead. to say. My second year of college, I became a mother. Mm. And um, I was shamed, big shame. But I, I kept going to class. She's right there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I lived on campus. I walked to class every day. I went to work every day. I studied. And I just knew there was this de determination. You know, I, I have to have a a better life for us than I had. Mm -hmm. By any means necessary, I'm, I'm going to grind it out. And I, you know, I felt some kind of way being on the college campus, a little bitty skinny girl with this big old belly. I was 98 pounds, nine months pregnant. Oh, wow. <laughs> 98 pounds, nine months pregnant. With a whole body in there. And one day I was getting on this elevator, and there was a professor, whoever she was, she stopped me and she said, keep going, mm. don't give up. You have no clue how many others you may be inspiring right now. Mm. Because I didn't drop out. She said, a lot of, a lot of our students are running to get rid of theirs. Mm. But keep going. And it just changed my whole perspective. I wasn't embarrassed anymore. I sit in microbiology class and the friends would watch Naya do all kind of dances and tricks in my belly. <laughs> Robot, I wasn't embarrassed anymore, but mm. it was an obstacle. Yeah. And I almost dropped out. Mm. But I just kept going, kept going, kept trying, never gave up. Then when she was born, she sit in the little car seat and we would read American history. <laughs> you know, put in front of the TV and say, look, you got to watch cartoons. I have to study. And if that didn't work, she had to study too. <laughs> she spent two million libraries. They both have college, many, several college campuses. I just had to find a way to do it, to make it happen. Mm. Wow. Power shift. Power shift. Power of pivot. Listen, guys, y'all have been great. That's been my time. Um, I'm, 
My job is never to impress you, only to impress upon you. Yeah. The power of using your story. I can do it, little country boy from rural Mississippi, mm -hmm. with nothing. You can do it. If I can come back from a 1.7, you can do it. I know y'all got higher than that, right? right. You better have higher than that, right? <laughs> right? Right? And he graduated, right? He came back, right? And so if, if, if I can do it, you can do it. Do not let people use your story as a deficiency. Yeah. Always use your story for power purposes. You control the narrative of your story, of your life. If I had to let them control my narrative, I'd still be sitting down doing nothing. Man, I get to travel the country and inspire young people. I'm living my dream. Right. I ain't made a million yet. You can live. You can live your dream without making a million. Yeah. Don't let social media fool you. I'm living my dream like to get to come and inspire y'all and talk to y'all and see y'all face. That's my dream. This is my dream job. People say, what's your dream job? I'm living it. Right. Standing right here. I'm, I'm living my dream job to talk to y'all, tell y'all about my experience, because I know somebody going to hear it and be like, I ain't going down that path. I can avoid it. If you can avoid it, avoid it. And so that's been my time. Thank y'all. Let's get into some questions back here.